don't know what it dates to yet at this point. Well, we've, we've, we've got some charcoal samples and a couple projectile points so far, but um, it, it, it's looking pretty good. And you can see all around it, uh, this is kind of the, the feature over here, focus. It's about 200 centimeters in diameter, large, uh, what I think is going to be a roasting pit once we get down more on it. But what, what, what you can see is our archaeologists here have started to pull back around it and what looks like to be some sort of concentration of burnt rock sort of surrounding the feature. Um, I will say this was not easy to get down to this level. Uh, we excavated a total of 58 levels last week out here at, at just in Block A and uh, that equates to you at home to about six tons of dirt. You can see it back here where Emery and Carly are standing. That's all dirt that's come out of this unit out here. So. Uh, in the process of coming down on it, we uh, we found three more ceramics. So uh, I'm starting to feel really good about the late prehistoric component that we're coming down on out here. Uh, all the shirts look to be uh, close to uh, Leon Plain or uh, Doss Redware uh, initially. So we're going to take a closer look at it as, as the, the excavation progresses. And hopefully, uh, as we expand this area going forward, we'll find some more and really kind of tie into it. So. Um, we did get a couple of projectile points out of here, um, and uh, I'm going to grab them real quick. Just for you at home, let me give you guys a close-up here. Um, we don't know what this is yet. Uh, we're still loosely looking at it, but it's a uh, very large, sort of, uh, probably what was a preform or was initially going to be formed into a point, but is now uh, kind of, it was tossed away because it, it really is, I don't know if you can see there, but it's very thick. And we've got some really interesting sort of uh, thin biface fragments that uh, look like they could be uh, probably a preform or something, but it was also probably broke during production and was kind of tossed here in this uh, trash bin. I'm back. <laughs> Mason's back here now. And... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, this, this, this midden zone, hopefully uh, in the next uh, couple days, we'll get it cleared off and we'll be able to sort of really tell what we have going on out here. But it's, as you can see, a very slow excavation process. So. Are those flags, are those from where those, oh yeah, 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 that's a good point, Mason, thank you. Sure, so these, these projectile points, uh, in order to kind of, you know, keep us from stepping on them during our excavations and stuff like that we flag them so when uh, we have our, our our fancy survey equipment out here we could what we call piece plot them so we know exactly where their elevation came from their depth um, you know their the context what level all that good stuff so this is a way for us to keep the data intact. so um, yeah and just real quick I wanted to give you guys an update on block D uh, which we were in last week uh, that you got we, we were filming from that is a burn rock midden we've since bisected and uh, are coming down on it and it looks to be about 30 to 40 centimeters thick and potentially next week when you join us, or I'm sorry, two weeks when you join us after the Thanksgiving break, we'll have an update out there and, and, and tune you into the excavation there. So, But thanks, that's our update and I'm going to hand it off now to Mason. Hi, it's me, I got out of the, it's, you're right, it wasn't so bad. So thanks Josh, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> hey Josh, real quick, what does bisected mean? Oh, bisected means to cut in half. Great, kind of like a you. kind of yeah, like a welcome. bicycle has two wheels. You bisect a feature and it splits it into two parts. And so we often bisect features like that to allow us to see what they look like from the side. Um, and then we can figure out how things kind of were formed and uh, how all the different um, components that go into uh, how they built a certain feature. And so bisecting is an important part of, of some of the work that we do. So a lot of times we'll take pictures of them uh, from above and then we'll cut them in half and we'll take pictures and drawings and things like that from the sides as well. That way we can see how the whole thing was put together in three dimensions. So um, anyway, but I wanted to talk, you know, we try to do a, a little bit of a deeper dive each week. And so this week, uh, you know, I guess a lot of people are thinking about Thanksgiving and it's the holiday season and we're thinking about food and so what better time to talk about uh, prehistoric foods and food preparation 
And so we have a perfect feature here that we wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about in uh, the context of food and food preparation. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we had a great term for this. This is this week's featured feature. Dun, 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 dun. Um, and what you kind of have here is this is a cooking hearth feature that is, I can stand over here to give you an idea of how big it is. It's, you know, about three feet across or so. And it's a nice flat surface here along the top. And then you have a lot of scattered rocks kind of thrown around outside here. Um, and so our initial interpretation is that this is the original intact feature part over here. And then this is all what we call cast off, which is essentially as they kind of clear off the top uh, of old burned rocks, if they're gonna make another one, or if they're just kind of done with it and they don't need it anymore, then they will throw the rocks off to the sides. And so that's why you have just sort of a jumbled mess out over in this area, but you have a nice compact, uh, dense spot right here. And there's actually kind of a void in between here where there's not very many rocks at all. And that is that uh, where somebody has come along and just kind of gone and kicked a bunch of rocks off. Essentially, that's our, our interpretation. Drosh, is that correct? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yeah, absolutely. Good. And so they have this nice flat surface like this. And what that does is that you can build a fire on top of it. And these rocks get nice and hot. And uh, you may not want to cook things directly over fire. You may want to, to bake them or even like fry them like in a griddle like pancakes or things like that. And so what you have is this nice flat surface that you can actually set foods down on. And after you move the, after you, uh, after the fire has gotten good and hot, you can actually move the fire off, you know, kind of scrape it out of the way and the rocks themselves will stay hot and stay warm. And you can actually cook foods on it directly. And so over time, what happens is um, the, the cooking of these rocks causes, these are all limestone, which is in Texas, in this region, limestone is everywhere. And uh, a lot of our buildings are made out of limestone. It's just kind of, it's just, it's, in central Texas in particular, it's all over the place. And so most of the rocks that they use for cooking are limestone rocks. And so what you have is you start out with natural limestone cobbles like these. And then over time, those cobbles, here I can get up a little closer. Here, I'll make it a here. They break up. This is a before and after. So these are what these cobbles look like before. Uh, not these, but these. And so they're nice and powdery and gray and they have a kind of, they're kind of rounded and that sort of a thing. But over time, after they've been uh, heated up over and over and over again, they break up and they get hard angles like these. And you can see here's two examples. These are burned rocks. And essentially this is a telltale sign uh, in this region that people have been living here and cooking here because these rocks don't get this way from just one firing that usually takes several. And uh, these rocks themselves are um, a, a, the, a great way for us to kind of figure out where cooking was taking place versus where tool production was taking place and things like that. Okay. So. Really quickly, Mason, too, yeah. I don't want to cut you off. I want to no, jump no. in here, and I want to show you uh, what we think right here. Uh, this large rock is uh, right now working theory that it might be a uh, kind of a, uh, a tossed out central heating element. It's much larger rock than the other rocks surrounding it, and the thought process is, is this rock would have sat somewhere in the central portion of the feature, and it would have held more heat and kind of, uh, you know, Maybe cooking a larger, larger thing or more things, uh, or maybe something that needed to cook longer. Yeah, exactly. And you, you'd have one of these, and you can see it's very, uh, it's not powdery like Mason was alluding to earlier. It's it's uh, it's a lot denser, and it, it looks like it's been kind of you know maybe removed from the feature. So it's a really good indication that we have some sort of large uh, cooking or heating elements going on inside the feature right now. So. so um, what you can kind of see, so there's a lot of cooking going on, and we talked about the burned rock mitten. That's another kind of, if you can imagine a single hearth like this, 
that is used and reused and reused and reused over and over and over again by a lot of people, then you get a bigger and bigger and bigger rock pile. And um, that's essentially what that midden is that's over on the other side. It's a more of a community oven and um, it's more jumbled and mixed, but you can get a whole lot more data out of it. So um, this is, these are two kind of examples of what cooking was, what some of their main tools for cooking were. Uh, this would be sort of the oven, essentially. And we've done some analysis and some studies about, now this is just preliminary stuff. Sorry, I should talk this way. Um, we've done some preliminary analysis and study on what they were eating. Um, and this isn't exhaustive by any means, but I brought some pictures and examples of what we found. And these are, you know, um, as far as what they hunted, these are animals and um, that they, uh, we have some bones from, uh, the, from the site that have some burning on them. And so right here, here's, a, here's one. Obviously white-tailed deer are very common throughout the North America and they're also very common here in Texas. We actually have, just this morning, there are like four of them running around yeah. just on the other side. They're out here um, every day. <laughs> yeah, they're out here all the time. We also found some bones from, um, Actually, Josh, where's that? Oh, that's all right. We had a, I have brought that box out that has all the stuff in it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's over there somewhere. Chicago. Lauren's gonna get it. So um, we also have uh, American bison bone. And there are some, uh, these really aren't around here anymore, but we've actually found some bone and some teeth from American bison. And Josh, we grabbed some of the examples of those artifacts. He's gonna bring some out now. Uh, we'll look at that. And then, we actually found some rabbits, some bones from, from jackrabbits. And so we have actually specialists that we send off. We get little pieces of bone. Here's a tooth from a bison. You can see it there. See all the ridges and stuff and how huge it is. It's kind of like our molars, but much, much, much bigger. Uh, the molars, the ones in the back. Um, and these are for eating plants and stuff like that. So it's an herbivore of some kind. Um, uh, let me see. We also have, really appropriate for this time of year, we've actually found some large uh, bird bones, but they were too fragmentary to really formally identify, but we're pretty sure, given the size, they're probably turkeys. So, gobble, 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 gobble. This was, would be something that they ate um, out here as well. And then, um, and they also enjoyed a little bit of seafood too. We've had lots of uh, freshwater mussel, mussel shells that they recovered from the creek, you know, maybe from Bleeders Creek over here or Kamal River. Uh, lots of mussel shells out over in that direction. But they had to have a balanced diet, as we all should, so they had lots of plants as well. So uh, we found um, plant fibers in some of these features like this. Um, and these plant fibers are, we've gotten some uh, wild onions and garlic. Oh, by the way, for those of you who are watching, Chime in on the chat window and tell us if you're going to be having turkey next week. I'm curious if anybody does or not. And Lauren will tell us if anybody does. Okay. So, but anyway, to spice up their foods, they have garlic and onions that they could pull. This is wild garlic and onions. We found some, some fibers from those types of plants. Um, this is camas. These are the, this is the flowers of camas and these are the bulbs. These are relatives of asparagus. And we found some, some bulbs inside some of the features. I don't like asparagus myself, but apparently the people who lived here probably did. Um, also, we found some seeds from the lace hedgehog cactus. And these are actually edible. Um, I would assume that they probably take the spines off first before they tried to eat it. But, uh, you know, I could be wrong. But we found some seeds from this, and these are edible plants. So uh, that's another, uh, some of the plants that they're eating out here. And then um, yucca and sotol. Now we haven't actually found any of these plant fibers just yet, uh, but having worked on sites like these for years and years at this point, these are in every single site um, in this region. Uh, actually the, the hearts of these are just um, in that, where all the uh, leaves get together, it's, you can actually uh, cook those for a long time in middens like over there and you can eat them. They're relatives of the um, agave which is used to make tequila but um, around here most of them we have yucca and sotol so these are very common. And then finally 
We've got some pecan shells, so they were, or not pecan, uh, walnut shells, so they're probably eating some walnuts. And then uh, for cooking, and anybody who is a Central Texas barbecue fan knows uh, live oak. Um, so far, all of the cooked, uh, the, the burned wood that we found out here in association with all these types of features, it's all live oak. So it probably tasted pretty good. Great. We have one person saying they're going to have turkey and some green beans and potatoes, but I guess no yeah. potatoes. Yum. No, we haven't found any potatoes. Um, and then somebody wants to know, what kind of testing do you uh, run to determine what was cooked here? So, ah, that's a great question. So we do two, di two different types of testing. Um, one is we actually have, so uh, you can see here that uh, we're excavating some soil, and the soil goes into these buckets right here. And those buckets make their way over to the screening area back there. And so all the artifacts that are mixed up in this soil um, comes through, they, they stay in the screen while the dirt falls through and we can collect all of them. And a lot of times little pieces of bone, like that piece of bone that I showed you earlier, those will stay in the screen and we can send those pieces of bone off to specialists called faunal analysts. And faunal analysts will actually look at those and they can identify them. Sometimes, the pieces are so small that they may only be able to tell that it's a large mammal or a small mammal or it's an amphibian or, or whatever. But in other times they can actually identify them right down to the specific species. And, um, and, so, and then they give us a report back that says this bone was this type of animal and this bone was that. And then we can actually then connect it to where they came from and we can start to make some sort of inferences of the types of foods that they ate. Now when it comes to the plants, most of this stuff is collected from inside, and here we'll go back over here, inside the feature itself. So kind of all this dirt that's down inside here, this is what we like to call a feature matrix. And you, we can actually collect some of that dirt and mixed in with all of that dirt, there will be little pieces of plant fibers or if it was cooked, it might be burned, so it's charcoal, but it still retains its form and its shape. And then we can send those little pieces of plants to other specialists called macrobotanical analysts. And macro meaning kind of bigger than micro, essentially. Botanical meaning plants. So they look at small, but not super, super small plant pieces. And they can do the same thing, kind of like what faunal analysts do. They can identify what plants they come from. And so, um, that's kind of, those are the two main ways that we uh, look at how they get food. And that's a great segue into kind of the, the sum up on this food thing is, you know, you know, why do we spend so much time learning about food and studying how they prepare food and what the foods are that they ate? And um, I think the best analogy for that would be in our own kitchens. Um, if you kind of... Uh, Everybody's house or everybody's apartment or wherever they live, most often the kitchen is kind of the central part of their lives in a weird way. It's kind of like the central hub that everything else revolves around. And in many ways, that's what food is for culture. And in a lot of respects, food and food preparation and diet and cuisine and all those different things are almost like a, a central reflection of what that culture is and what their and what their lives are like. And so when you think of, you know, Italy, you pretty quickly think of the food that they eat there. Um, and the same goes with this. Because food and diet is so central to the culture itself, we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort studying the food that they ate so that we can really learn a lot more about the culture as a whole. And then in addition, in this modern world, we have refrigerated trucks and we have uh, shipping infrastructure that allows us to get, you know, lobsters from Maine or sea bass from Chile or wherever. But back in these days, they relied much more on what was immediately around them to eat. And so we can actually pick up a lot more inferences about the climate, about the environmental conditions, um, about um, seasonality. So maybe they were hunting deer during certain periods of the year, but not others, or they were harvesting different types of plants at different times. Um, we can pick up a lot of side information 
surrounding the cultural manifestations of the food. And so that's why we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort looking into the food uh, preparation and their diet. So if anybody has any other questions, you can put them down in the comments part in the bottom and we'll try to answer them when we can. But otherwise, I'm gonna hand it back over to Josh. Does anybody have any other questions, Lauren? No, nope, you got it. Okay. Well, I, over the, the course of the week, we have tours come out here every so often, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And a lot of time when I'm out here digging with the guys here around us and the girls around us, you know, people will just come up and ask some random questions to us, you know? And, uh, you know, one often that, that we get asked a whole lot is, you know, where do we go to the bathroom out here, you know? And where do you go to the bathroom out here? It's a secret. No, ah, no. Someday they'll tell me. No, I mean it's 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 just like just like everywhere else, you know. When you see a construction site, we have you know restrooms spaced out across the site and stuff like that. So that's not a big deal. That's usually the number one question. But in all seriousness, we do get some pretty some pretty good questions out here. Um, so one, you know, that was just asked to me recently was where do the artifacts go that we dig up? Like we, we spend a lot of time out here painstakingly. You know, trailing and digging and, and you know, it, it, hanging out. I mean, your knees are on rocks all day. It's, it's, it can be a little, you know, wear and tear on you. Uh, but we do all that so that we can take all these artifacts and we, we take them. Uh, you, if you guys tuned in, uh, last week we did a focus on our lab. We process all our stuff there first here in the field and then we take it back to our own laboratory in our office. And that's where we do a lot of uh, the analysis that happens uh, from the stuff that we're inferring. You know, Mason talked a lot about the different foods and bones and stuff like that we've collected out here. We know all that from the processing and the analysis that we do back at home in our home office. And so that's where they go first. We, we borrow them essentially for a while. And then when we're done with our analysis, we pass them along to uh, a curatorial facility, which basically means a housing, a place where they will permanently uh, stay for researchers to eventually, if, if they have if they have questions they want to answer, they can pull our collection and go look at it. And for this particular project, that area will be uh, the Center for Archaeological Studies at Texas State University or or CATS. So that's that's kind of where we go. So, Mason, did you have any other uh, questions that you would like? Are y'all are y'all going to be working next week? We are not. So we are we are going to be down next week for the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, during that time, we're going to be doing a lot of processing. It's sort of our, uh, I guess you could say, halftime. I know a lot of you will be watching football during the Thanksgiving games out there, but uh, we're taking a halftime out here uh, next week, and we're going to kind of look at what we have and, uh, and, and kind of readjust our strategies and, and pull all of our data together so it's not such a monumental task uh, when we break for the field, uh, when we're wrap up our excavations out here okay so um, yeah I think uh, so later on tonight we're gonna be out here at the site we're gonna be having like a, uh, a an evening tour followed by a presentation by one of our other archaeologists named Rachel fight she's gonna be giving a presentation on uh, feasting prehistoric feasting and foods in Texas kind of a much better and uh, much more learned discussion than of what I kind of covered just a little while ago uh, and so there's still space available if you'd like to come and uh, you can sign up on the website for that uh, It'll be this evening from 530 to 730 so um, I don't know, anything Yeah, else, yeah, and, and uh, also, you know, since we won't be posting live next week uh, We will be here the following week after Thanksgiving um, The following Thursday and uh, we'll actually be joined out here by Chris Ringstaff a archaeologist with Texas Department of Transportation who will be giving sort of a talk and a a discussion on lithic technology, which basically means rocks uh, that are used to form projectile points, uh, tools, other sort of uh, lithic stone tools. And Chris is one of the uh, best flint nappers that I've ever seen. I don't know, Mason, I know you've seen him work a lot. He's, he's fantastic and it'll be a really interesting uh, discussion. So we hope you all tune in. He's much better than me too. Uh, I always cut my hands. But uh, I hope you you turn in next week. Or and there might yeah, that's true. There might be blood. Yeah. Next so week. that's exciting. Next time. So but, uh, tune in. Yeah, tune in. And again, be sure to like and subscribe us. Uh, you know, go to the website uh, Headwaters at the Comal, and uh, you know we'll be here. So so tune in, please. All right. Thank you. Thank you.